Good evening. Uh, welcome again to Social Organization. This is the fifth session in the series, lectures 9 and 10. I'd like to begin this evening by turning in my Bible to the book of Genesis. Uh, I'm going to be looking at chapter 29 at the story of Jacob <coughs> marrying Leah and Rachel. The focus for our series tonight is lectures on marriage. And uh, so as we think about marriage, we'll begin with this biblical case study. Beginning with verse 15. <clears throat> After Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, Just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is complete and I want to lie with her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob, and Jacob lay with her. And Laban gave his servant girl Zilpah to his daughter as her maidservant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, What is this you've done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, It is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant girl Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her maid servant. Jacob lay with Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he worked for Laban another seven years. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, <clears throat> you've given us this story. You've given it to, to us to teach us things about our relationships with one another and about our relationships with you. Oh, Father, the story of Jacob is a long one, and we've only even just touched a very short portion of it tonight. But in it, Lord, we see so many of the things that are part of our family relationships and our family lives. Lord, we see tension. We see uh, deception. We see uh, the conflict between parents and children. And Lord, we see customs playing out uh, in certain kinds of ways that bring hardship upon people. Oh, Lord, we come to you tonight. We recognize that this is our culture. This is our world. And you came into the world to redeem us, to bring us into a special relationship with yourself. We ask, Lord, as we study this subject tonight, that you would open our eyes to who we are as people and how we shape our marriages and our cultures. And then, Lord, help us to understand how you would shape us anew in Christ Jesus. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen. As we think about this subject tonight, uh, the first thing I want to look at is the issue of who can you marry. A typical uh, understanding of marriage in any culture, in any society, there are some people who are forbidden to you because to marry them would be incest, and there are other people who are forbidden to you because they are defined as being in your group and you can't marry somebody in your particular group. If you remember in the case study that we had uh, looking at the people in Cameroon, in our previous series of lectures, I said to you that a man could not marry the people in his own quarter in the village. He could not marry into the quarter of his father, I mean his father's mother, and he could not marry into the quarter that his mother came from. And so there were basically three sections of that particular community in which a man could not take a wife. Now we have on the screen here the idea of incest and exogamy. Incest means that to marry someone would violate a taboo that would be a biological taboo, a taboo that people have in their culture that defines an improper marriage, a marriage that's too close in relationship, a marriage that violates blood rules. The exogamy rule is a rule that says that you have to marry outside of your group. It has nothing to do with incest. It has rather to do with the notion that uh, a group is a particular, has a particular identity and that in planning a marriage, you should not marry somebody with that particular group identity. So as we look at the notion of marriage, every society has some notion of uh, incest 
And usually they have some notion of exogamy or the other opposite of that we would call endogamy, E-N-D-O-G-A-M-Y, which means marrying inside. For example, um, when I grew up, it, my parents taught me that I could not marry my first cousins, that that would be incest, it would be too close. They uh, taught me that I could not marry my brothers, uh, my sisters, obviously, uh, or the sisters couldn't marry their brothers, that that would be close. And it was prohibited to have even thoughts about relationships with aunts and uncles or with nieces and nephews. All of those would be prohibited. They are what we call incest rules. But um, it was also, um, th we were taught that we should marry somebody who is from our church. We should marry inside a particular denomination, inside a particular fellowship group. We should marry a Christian who came from the same kind of community that we came from. And it was very strongly felt that you should marry within a particular kind of group. Uh, it was interesting, just a few years ago, one of my aunts did some significant work on the genealogy in our families. And what she discovered was that uh, the rule of endogamy had been operating for a long period of time. But the rule of incest had changed. Uh, that um, going back in the genealogies of my parents, four generations, she discovered that many of our ancestors married first cousins. Uh, and it was very common for them to do so. And in fact, they discovered that my father and mother were fourth cousins, and they were descendants of first cousins who had married. Uh, and so that this whole notion of first cousins being incestuous is a relatively recent notion within our community. But the idea of marrying inside your group was very strong. And the reason they married first cousins back in those days was because they could be sure that those first cousins had the same religious commitments, had the same basic belief system, and that to marry outside would get them into other kinds of groups that were considered to be dangerous groups. And so the rule to marry inside was more important than the notion of incest. It was only in my grandmother's generation that people began to talk about first cousin marriage and think that it might be bad. And finally, in my parents' generation, it was forbidden that they should marry first cousins. And of course, that was passed on to me. So marriage customs change over time. We're going to find when we look at the scriptures, for example, we look at the case study of Laban uh, and Jacob. Jacob was a first cousin to Leah and Rachel. And so it really wasn't incestuous to marry somebody who was a first cousin. Instead, it was okay. So if we look at marry who, marriage, who is eligible? And that's one of the questions we want to ask. Who does society, society prefer? In thinking of preference, uh, it's very clear if you read the story of Laban and Jacob and I saw I, Isaac and Rebecca, that uh, Isaac and Rebecca sent Jacob to Laban's place specifically that he would marry there. And they were very upset that Esau married foreigners outside of their family in the place where they were living. And so if you look at the preferences that Isaac and Rebekah had, they clearly preferred that their sons would marry their close relatives and that they would not marry these people from outside. Uh, it says that they were very upset with Esau because he married two of the local women who were around them. And he didn't ask their permission. He did what he pleased. And so that was something that was of great concern to them. Uh, Rebecca was so upset that she came to Isaac and said, let's please send Jacob over to my brother and let him find a wife there so that he will not marry as Esau has done with the local women. Well, um, <clears throat> preferred and permitted are two different things. Uh, it, it's one of those questions that uh, Esau was permitted to marry. They didn't stop him marrying these other women, but it was not preferred. And Esau, recognizing his parents' anger with him, then married one of Ishmael's daughters, and that brought him into a closer family relationship. The scripture doesn't tell us whether his parents were happy with that or not. There's also the notion that there are some who are forbidden. And in looking at marriage relationships, one of the things you need to ask is, who is preferred, who is permitted, and who is forbidden? Those questions will help you understand how the people in that particular culture define these parameters for themselves. As I said, they're different from one culture to the next. And they're even different from generations uh, to generations. In my own family, I can clearly document how this changed over a period of about 100 years. OK, <clears throat> marriage is more than just a sexual relationship. Uh, it's a social contract. And as we think about marriage rules and we think about looking at uh, what people do in their marrying relationships, we want to look at all of the dimensions of the social contract. Again, if you think about this particular story with 
uh, Laban and Jacob, there were some very specific contractual things that happened in that story. Uh, they had an agreement, and Jacob agreed to work for seven years so that he would get a wife. And they sat down and they discussed it in the beginning. So there was a clear contract. At the end of the seven years, the scripture said, Jake was happy. I've finished my work. Now give me my wife. Uh, well, uh, Laban pulled a fast one on him. Now you might wonder how that could happen. Uh, if you wonder that, it's because you live in a world with electricity. And you've never been in a place where there are only stars out at night. <laughs> you know, it can be very, very dark. And you can have some nights with cloud cover. You can't see a thing. And so it's very, very possible. It's certain that Leah was in agreement with this. She had to agree to it to happen. And she would have probably worn a veil going into the house. And once she got in the house, Jacob could not have seen. There is no possible way that he could see because of the darkness. Uh, and so in looking at this, it was very easy for this deception to occur. If Leah was agreeable to it, then uh, it was something that Jacob uh, really couldn't have prevented. And so in looking at this, uh, Jacob was deceived. And when, we, when he woke up in the morning, uh, he was aghast at what had happened. And looking at this issue of marriage as social contract, the first thing you want to look at is who has control over the arrangements. In the story that we've looked at, it was clearly Laban. Laban was the one who had the power to control the, the marriage. Uh, in other societies, it may be different. And as you look at the social arrangements, for example, when I got married, um, I am the one who had the exercise the control over it. Uh, the actual decision, my wife and I made that decision. Now, I did call my father and ask him if he objected. But if he had objected, I'm not sure what if I would have done. I would have probably gone on anyway. Uh, my father was wise enough to say yes you know, and not create a dispute with his son. But my, my father and I always had a good relationship. And so it was not that, that we would have thought about this. And to be honest with you, when I called him, I was a little anxious. I wondered what he would say, particularly because I was only a junior in college at the time. And uh, my wife had, was graduating, but we wanted to marry before I graduated. And my father could have legitimately said, wait another year. Uh, but he didn't. I guess he knew that he married at the same age that I did. And so he really couldn't ask me to wait if he hadn't waited either. And, uh, you know, it, it's, I don't know why he made the decision he did. And I'm not worried about it at this point in time. But the interesting thing of it is that it was important to ask. It was very important to ask. And I did care about what he thought. And if he just said no, I would have really thought deeply about that. And it would have been something that I, I would have then wanted to talk to him more about it. Uh, the, the issue then of controlling the arrangements for a marriage is more complex than you might think at first hand. In other words, it's not just, well, I have the power to make my own decision, because if you do care about the other relationships you have, if you are concerned about the people in your family and in the other person's family, then you want to do what the family expects and discuss that in ways that would be appropriate. So as you think about these things, ask, answering the question, who exercises control, is one that is not just who says, I'm going to do it, but rather, what are all the other parameters? Uh, what, do, what about the time? For example, we talked about the time to get married. And we consulted with my wife's parents on this because traditionally in America, it's the wife's family who pays for the wedding. So as we look at that situation, then my father-in-law has a right to say when, when I can do it and when I can't. Uh, the interesting thing was that uh, he had two marriages that summer. Uh, Judy's younger sister married first, uh, and then eight weeks later, Judy married to me. And so uh, my father-in-law met people at the reception line and said, see you in eight weeks uh, after the first wedding. Uh, and in some ways, uh, that was a hardship for him financially. But in other ways, uh, it, was, it was something that was joyful. All right, as we look at these things, then, the control is the first question. The second question is, what are the customary arrangements for residents uh, when people actually marry? Now, I haven't gone into the ceremony at all. You might wonder about the ceremony. I'll come back to the ceremony, because the ceremony is actually a ritual event. I'm looking now at the social dimensions of marriage and the requirements that the society has in terms of what people do and how they do it. You might think, again, this, well, this is simple. I mean, doesn't everybody do the same thing? No, they don't. In fact, there are really quite dramatic different rules in terms of what happens when you marry in different places. Uh, for example, with the Dani Indians that I showed you a couple of lectures ago in Brazil, uh, at the marriage, the young 
man always moves into the household of his wife. Now, why? Uh, why is that required? Well, usually in Dany marriages, the guy is about 20 years old and the girl may be 12. Uh, and the uh, family is very much concerned about how this man takes care of their little girl because she's still literally a little girl. And so he has to work for his mother-in-law. He has to work for his father-in-law. He has to demonstrate that he's a good hunter. He has to demonstrate that he'll care for their daughter. And if he doesn't, they'll throw him out. And so they're not about to let this little girl go until he has demonstrated he's capable. So he may have to live with them for four or five years. Well, after the, their daughter has their first child, and they see that their daughter is going to be cared for, then the son-in-law and daughter can move out and they'll establish a house close by. And after they live in that house close by for a little while, then he can move anywhere he wants because the parents have seen that he's going to take care of their girl and this will be a satisfactory arrangement. Now that kind of arrangement is in a society where people are very individualistic, but not about this initial period of marriage. So how long does it apply is the first question. Uh, in this case, about four or five years for the Dany. Uh, how does residence change in the life cycle of the family? Well, I just described that for you with the Dany. It changes over time. And then, of course, there are reasons for residence change. What kinds of reasons for changes? Why would people move from one place to another? Interestingly, in this situation, in my own family situation, uh, my father-in-law expected that his daughter would move out, and my father expected that I would set up my own house somewhere else. And both families did not expect us to live close to them, nor would they have asked us to live close to them, although they would probably have been happy if we lived in the same town. When I say close, I mean in the same compound or in the same uh, street or in the same area. It just was not expected. We should establish our own independent household. That was part of what was expected of us. And um, ordinarily, we would not go back to our parents at any time in our life unless we were in some dire crisis. And in a dark crisis, they would open their homes to us again and welcome us back. But the expectation was that once we had married, we'd gone off and established our own. Now, that's quite contrary to what the Dany couple started out with. They were not even allowed to go away until about five years, until the, the daughter was secure in the eyes of the parents with her new husband. Other cultures, of course, have other rules. And we've talked last week about matrilocal residence in which a daughter stays with her mother and the husband moves in. And that could be lifelong. Uh, or it could be a relationship that lasts for a period of time and then is permitted to change. In every society, then, what are the customary arrangements for residence at marriage? And how does that affect how people live? Another question that you picked up in your reading for tonight are what we call the legal rights in marriage. What legal rights are actually conferred in marriage? Now, typically, again, in our own cultures, we just assume that marriages are the same everywhere. But in your reading, you should have picked up that people don't think the same about this. And they make certain kinds of distinctions. Obviously, one of the first things that is conferred in marriage is the rights to the sexual re relationship. In other words, when you marry a man or a man marries a woman, there is an expectation that they will then be partners together sexually and they will keep to themselves and not have relationships with others. In most societies, that is clearly an expectation for marriage. In some societies, the woman may be told that she does not have exclusive rights to the sexuality of her husband. That in case, for example, with Jacob, uh, it was very clear that, that Rachel and Leah both had sexual rights to Jacob and they couldn't exclude the other one. And later on in their lives when Rachel excluded Leah, there was a real source of conflict between them and it was a source of argument and fighting. And finally one day if you read carefully in the book of Genesis you find that Leah bargained with Rachel uh, so that she could have a relationship with Jacob again. Uh, there was a situation where Reuben went out and found mandrakes. Rachel wanted them because they were a fertility drug. And so she pled with Leah to give them to her. And Leah agreed if, he, if Rachel would, would allow her to sleep with Jacob again. So that kind of thing is something that can cause conflict in families. It can, it's a clearly a part of marriage. And our notion in my, our society that this is an exclusive right uh, would not be true in the case of Jacob. Now, again, another issue is the rights to the children. Who has rights to the children? And to which family do they belong? Uh, you know, it, it's an interesting question. Again, in, in my cultural setting, the children are mine and my wife's. 
and my parents don't have any claim to them. They're, they're happy to have grandchildren, uh, but uh, they say, well, they're Sherwood's and Judy's children, and we can't claim them. But uh, I don't think that'll be true in James's case, and when we interview him a little later, we'll ask him, uh, what rights does the family have over James's children? And how does that work out in the situation that he grew up in in Kenya? Uh, the rights to children is oftentimes defined in terms of bride wealth. And if one family pays the bride wealth, then they have exclusive rights to the children, and the other family can't claim those children for a particular purpose. And so who the children belong to and what the rights are are defined in those marriage ties. Another question is the rights to labor. Uh, who's, uh, who do you work for in a marriage relationship? And what are the expectations of the marriage? Let me put it this way in terms of contemporary American society. When a man and a woman get married, do they have two different checkbooks and two different salaries and they keep them separately, or do they share them? It's interesting, Americans don't agree on this. Uh, and in some situations, the husband and wife will insist upon having certain things differently, and then they will decide what things they share. And so they actually negotiate the shared arrangement between them. In other families, you have what we call the pooling of income, that whatever either one makes, they put it into a common pool, and they use it to, for whatever the family's needs are. Now again, how it works and what the family rules are, it probably depends on the couple. Uh, in my wife and my relationship, in the very, from the very beginning of our marriage, we've always pooled income. And we have never said, this is yours and this is mine. It's always been ours together to accomplish whatever we needed to do for the family. But I know other couples where that's very different. Uh, a wife may have her own checking account. A husband may have his own checking account. And they may not pool their income. So in looking at those things, the rights to labor and the rights to resources are something that may be negotiated in a particular cultural setting. Uh, the <clears throat> what rights do I have to the labor of my wife? Can I expect that she will always wash the clothes and always cook meals? Well, uh, in some cultures, if they don't, they have not fulfilled their duty and they can be divorced. That's grounds for divorce because the person has not fulfilled the rights of labor. And if you remember reading Ape's chapter, one of the things he says there is that that's a woman's responsibility in, in the, uh, the Igala household. And if she doesn't do it, that's grounds for divorce. Just not doing the laundry and cooking can be a reason for a husband to divorce his wife. So in looking at the labor, they take this right to labor very, very seriously. And they believe that this kind of exchange, a man doing certain things and a woman doing certain things, are really what make a legitimate marriage. And if those exchanges don't occur, then the marriage in some way is illegitimate. Another, uh, in, in other cultures, the particular items may be different. For example, in the culture that I worked on in the Pacific, the Yapese culture, the women worked in the fields and the men worked on the sea. And they had this notion that if you sat down to eat a meal and there was not fish and vegetable foods, that somebody hadn't done their work. Uh, and the person who consistently failed was then not performing their responsibilities in the marriage, not giving the labor that was needed, and there, this could be cause for a divorce. So if there was no vegetable foods, the woman wasn't doing her work. If there were no fish, the man wasn't doing his work. Uh, in the traditional culture, the man's job was actually harder because you could go fishing and not catch fish. Whereas if you were a good gardener, you could always have vegetable foods for the family. But fishing was something that depended not only on hard work, it depended upon being able to catch fish. And sometimes it was more difficult than others because of the weather, because of the tides, because of the areas where you were allowed to fish and maybe you couldn't fish in a good area. All of those could create difficulty for families. The last thing we have are the rights to personal or corporate property. It's interesting that in thinking about marriage, sometimes there are certain kinds of property that are just part of marriage. For example, my wife's family was supposed to pay for our marriage. Uh, Jacob had to work for seven years for Rachel. Then he had to work seven more years because he, he was given the wrong woman. And uh, Laban said, well, if you want her, you got to work. You know? And uh, he didn't make him wait seven years, but he made him work seven years. And so you have this expectation there are certain kinds of uh, requirements. And personal and corporate property can be part of that. Um, it, it'll be interesting when we look at James's case study to find out what he was required to do in terms of property before he could get married. And uh, we'll ask him to share that with us a little bit later. 
All right, as we think then about these legal rights, uh, it's, it's important to recognize that marriages in some societies may not confer all of these rights. And we need to find out what rights are actually conferred to understand how marriage really works. Or they may have more strict definitions than we have. And so we may not understand tension between a husband and wife. And we may think it's unreasonable because they, for example, the husband may be upset because the wife didn't do the laundry. And we don't have the idea in our minds that, hey, this is considered to be an obligation of marriage, fundamental to how the marriage works in that particular society. And this might be especially true of some of us who come from Western societies where these things are negotiable. Uh, if you, for example, look at my wife and I, uh, we have had an ongoing, f a lot of fun in our family about who does the wash. In fact, we even did a chapel here at Biola about five years ago uh, detailing the history of uh, that dispute between us is who should do the wash. Uh, if you're interested, you can get a tape in the media center and listen to it. But uh, it's, it's been a fascinating thing in our lives because uh, you see both of us work full time. Uh, and so when it comes down to all the responsibilities at home, we decided we needed to negotiate that. And the one thing that both of us hated to do was the laundry. And so uh, how did we work this solution out over the years? Well, we negotiated. And we still laugh about it because uh, we're kind of hoping that the other one runs out of clothes first. <laughs> and uh, one time, I'll tell you, I took some of my wife's clean clothes and put them in the dirty clothes basket <laughs> because I didn't want to do the wash. Don't tell her, OK? <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that it's just part of the good humor of your life that uh, you, in fact, have this, you can have this exchange. In some cultures, that would be impossible, you see. It just would not be negotiable, and it would be an insult. Uh, and in fact, when my wife and I were living on Yap, I would never help her with a wash, never. Because in Yap, if a woman didn't do wash for her husband, what that said was that she was angry with him because he had been involved in immorality. Uh, so if I was doing my wash, what that would be saying to the whole community is that I've been unfaithful to my wife, and she's refusing to do my laundry for me in that situation. Now, you see, if I'm, a, I'm an American missionary, and I go to Yap to be a missionary, and uh, my, my wife and I have this agreement that I'll do the wash this week and she'll do it next week. Every other week, I'm caught in adultery, you know. As far as the people are concerned, they're going to find this is very unacceptable. Well, these are the kind of things you need to understand. You know, our rules just don't fit in other cultures. And we have to know how to, to abide by their rules and understand their relationships, particularly as we contextualize a husband-wife marriage in those contexts. This stuff is probably much more important for what we model as we go overseas than for what we say. Uh, because if we model improper relationships between a husband and wife, then this will cause people to misinterpret us, to misunderstand what we're doing, and it will actually cause them, uh, in some cases, to to accuse us of things that we would not have done. In that case, it would have been immorality. On the other hand, there is also modeling things that are positive. In other words, one of the things that I can tell you is that oftentimes people in other cultures watch us in our marriage relationships to see how we really live out our lives together. And sometimes if they see very clearly that what we do is based upon love, then that can be really transforming. Uh, I think probably one of the greatest things that has ever happened to my wife and I is when we had a Burmese girl live with us for three years here in Southern California. Uh, she actually was brought home by one of the Yappies girls who lived with us. And in that situation, uh, she was being abused at home, and so we invited her to stay with us. And she stayed with us for three years. And she said to us after living with us for a year, she said, I've grown up in a house where I've never seen a ha happy marriage, never seen a husband and wife who loved each other. And she said, this is a wonderful experience that I have living with you to be able to see that kind of relationship. That's really what we can model as we go into other cultures. And as we try to live and work with other people, what we want to do is we want to try to live such lives that they can see Christ living in us. And that they can then build upon that and they can have positive relation. That, that as Christians, as they come to know Christ, that their relationships can be changed, not culturally, but in the deeper dynamic way of what it means to love one another in Christ. Of course, that may result in some cultural changes as well, but it's not that I want that. I'm not intentionally driving that. I don't care which one of them does the wash. That's not important. I don't care which one fishes and which one works in the garden. That doesn't matter. But what I do care about 
is whether or not they learn how to love one another and to make those exchanges in an attitude of love and support for one another. That's really where it's at. Okay, let's go on. In thinking about uh, these issues, economic exchange is an important part of marriage. Uh, we already looked at the story of Jacob, and we saw that labor was exchanged in that situation. In some societies, you have the necessity of bride wealth or bride service. We call um, <clears throat> Jacob's work bride service. Bride wealth would be where a certain amount of money has to be given uh, in other, for the woman to, to come to the home of the husband to be married to her. Uh, there's also the notion of dowry. Dowry tends to be the opposite, where the woman gives money to the husband's family or gives some wealth to the husband's family. So bride wealth, it comes from the husband's family to the wife's family. Dowry comes from the wife's family to the husband's family. Those are typically the two kind of exchanges that we find in these matters. <clears throat> you can explore this, and I've said enough about it now. I don't think I'll take any more time to look at it this evening. In looking at the ritual of marriage, the ritual tends to focus on the important meanings that are part of the culture and the society. And so as we think about what happens in other cultures ritually, we're going to try to understand how the ritual focuses on the strategic, meaningful components of the social organization of the family. How are rights and obligations in, in marriage symbolized? What happens? to basically say this is important. Fascinating thing about my own marriage relationship is that if you were to attend my wedding, you'd find that my wife's relative sat on one side of the church and my relative sat on the other side of the church. So you have the separation of the families, but they're united together. You have the father of the bride giving away his daughter. Uh, but the father of the groom is nowhere to be seen in the sense of this ceremony. In other words, it's the groom who receives, not the father of the groom. And the father of the groom sits and watches. I did that at my son's wedding. You know, I had no significant role but to watch. Uh, and it was really his responsibility to take this young woman, his responsibility to care for her, his responsibility to love her, and his responsibility to provide for her. There was nothing said about me providing for her. Nothing said about me providing for my son. It was all placed upon the man that was his job to do. So as you look at the ceremony, you see the ceremony focuses on the relationship between the man and the woman, and the one that I had, the one that my son had, whereas in other cultures, the ceremonies may focus on the relationship between the two families. And it's very important to recognize what's going on. Uh, if we look at the particular meanings that are associated with the ceremony, there are a whole number of different kinds of meanings that we might discover. And you have to look pretty deeply to get at these meanings. Uh, in thinking about the meaning issue, the, one of the things you might look at is what are the social ties that are reaffirmed. My computer is giving me a little trouble again tonight, so we'll put both of them. Social ties that are reaffirmed and values that are reaffirmed. Uh, what, what's happening in reference to these two things? Um, the... Um, Social ties between the husband and wife are the focus in a typical American marriage. But the social ties that we'll look at in James's case study will be different. And we want to get him to tell us about that and have him help develop that for us. If you look at John Ape's case study, what John Ape says in that case is that there is a seven-year process in which there's certain kinds of exchanges going on between the husband's family and the wife's family. So it's a continuing linkage between two families. And that linkage of those families is an important part of that relationship. What values are reaffirmed? Well, if you look at the marriage vows of American, in American weddings, you see there are some very significant kinds of values that are affirmed in the vows themselves. If you look at <clears throat> the actual ceremony itself, you see at the end of the ceremony the husband and wife going off in a car all by themselves uh, to where, where nobody knows. Okay? So that basically is symbolic. What it says is that the husband and wife leave and they go off on their own and it really doesn't matter. No one really knows where they go. Where if you look at Jacob's wedding, uh, Leah was brought to him in the house right there in the family where he was and they were known and that's where they stayed. Uh, and if you look at James's wedding, you're going to find the same thing, that he didn't go off somewhere where nobody knows. It was very clear where 
they were known, and this was known that this was the beginning of their relationship together. So in thinking about the values, they really are played out in the actual kinds of ceremonial activities that occur. And you can get at these by looking at the, the marriage ceremonies itself. Okay, at this particular point, uh, we're going to take a look at an African case study. So, uh, James, why don't you come up? We'll give you the uh, microphone, and I'll operate the computer for you. You just tell me when you want me to change the picture, and I'll do it. Uh, you can just sit right there. That'd be great. Well, actually, come over a little bit so that they can, your colleagues can see the the uh, picture, yeah. and uh, you can s also see. I'm sorry, I took that off of you. <coughs> Tell us uh, the story, James. Uh, as you think about this uh, wedding, uh, the first thing I want to ask you is, uh, when did it all start? Uh, I have there on the screen 1973. <laughs> Obviously, that's not James in 1973. Uh, it's an older picture. But tell us about 1973, James. Um, uh, 1973 is when I began seriously to pray for my life partner. And that is my wife. Um, I did not, I lived with the girls as my sisters. I did not want to be attached to one in particular because I knew that I'm going to be humbled in uh, my stages of life. I did not want the responsibility then. But I had time to pray and to ask God to provide me with this beautiful, marriageable woman, diligent. Also, so this was a time, and this is my younger brother, and uh, he, he is always very close to me. So what I did, I prayed and asked God, do it, Lord. And I asked him, uh, how will I know? Because I, I believe in miracles. And um, what happened in 1976, I went to a, a church. Do you want me to move? No, you're okay. I went to a church. Um, uh, they invited me to go and speak there, 1976, preaching there. And when I went there, a young lady stood with uh, the family members to sing. And uh, when I was seated down there at the back bench, I looked and I, I, uh, I saw a, a young woman. And uh, deep in my heart, there were messages that that is the one, that is the one, that is the one. Wow, I was not going to have to see a girl in this uh, church and, uh, and begin to think about it. I challenged that seriously because I, I felt this was the highest crime of infatuation um, coming in me. And uh, during this year, 1970. 73 and in the 70s in Kenya, uh, you had to be heaven bound. If you speak about things of the earth here, you are backsliding. Something is happening. And brothers and sisters are going to ask you, oh, you're a fallen brother. Mm, something is happening. So what I did was to challenge that seriously to death. But before I finished preaching, the spirit again came. A voice came again and said, uh, find a time and speak to this young girl. Find a time. So when you walk out, find a time. See that to speak to her. When I walked out, there was nobody. I mean, she was not there. Many other sisters that knew me went outside and said, oh, Buva, 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 our Buva. I was a famous young man, by the way. <laughs> but, now that you're old, you're no longer famous, right? Um, <laughs> In other ways, <laughs> telling a story. But uh, there was not that girl that I saw. So the buva is not coming very well here. So I stood outside uh, because normally in our church, the, um, the pastor and the elders count the, uh, 
the offerings and have a little kind of committee before we break for uh, uh, did, um, lunch. So I waited outside and a, a middle-aged woman came to me and said, let's go to my home for a lunch. Uh, we will prepare lunch for you. And I looked at it and said, okay, it is not in accordance with the norm or custom. Uh, men in my culture are told, stay away from women. Even when we greet women, we don't have our hands stay there for a long time. Okay. Greet and get out of there. <laughs> because they will say there was a communication going on there. So what happened was I looked at it and, and said to this woman, Lydia, who later became my mother-in-law, I told her, I'm sorry, uh, next time. So we parted. And um, I went to school, uh, Scott Theological College, um, this year, 1976. And then I began to study the uh, the things of God and other things. In fact, that's where I, I, I came into terms with teaching. I had a course in teaching and practical. So, 76, 77, and uh, I was still praying about this. And uh, the voice was still coming. You know, you saw a girl, you saw a girl, but where is she? Mm -hmm. I could not find her. So, um, 1977, I came to the school uh, nearby their home. And I was coming to, uh, to do some devotions mm -hmm. and also teach. I remember mm -hmm. I was teaching about biology. I was teaching about the uh, white blood cells and the red corpuscles. <laughs> platelets. And okay, Jay, you got to hurry faster. We're going to run out yes, of time. Yes, thank you. And our brother was there. So, and I did not know. But one day I asked the teachers, um, uh, where is the family of so-and-so? They said, it's outside there just outside there, very close to us. I went and uh, I found them in the garden plowing, hoeing, oh, hoeing the land. And that's where I saw her. And when I saw her, my heart uh, smiled. And you're still smiling. And I'm still smiling at this moment. <laughs> so we, we began to talk and we went home, we talked. She cooked for us that night. The following day, they invited me for breakfast we came, and that is the time we exchanged our entrance. And uh, so I continued to teach there, but I went uh, back to college. So I stayed 77, 78. I felt I was ready to go and know this lady and really to, to have something coming. So, but I could not. Uh, as a man, I wanted not to speak words that are going to be empty and not received. I fear that. I fear failure. I'm the firstborn. We don't fail, you know. But then um, that did not uh, come true that uh, I should know uh, her 1978. But 79 came, March, and I told the Lord, now, Lord, and during that period, many girls began to, uh, to write me and say, Mr. Boover, we need to think about our future together. Oh, my. I began really to be so highly frightened. I mean, what is happening? Am I going now to polygamy? <laughs> 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 what is this, my Lord? I remember I fasted about this. And I told the Lord, sweep all of these girls that are coming. I don't want this. And then the Lord lifted uh, a, a rudder up in my prayer time. And I, I beheld and said, oh, I need to do this. So I went to the city. I asked, where is Rhoda? I asked some brothers. They told, oh, she's at home. Oh, I asked them, is she standing in the faith? Oh, yes, she's born again. She's heaven bound. Oh, thank you. So, but in the January of 1979, she wrote me a letter. Oh, James, my parents accept you so much. We love you here at Mia Hatom. Uh, I passed examinations. Everything is good. Oh, my Lord, I said, thank you. But then in the same month, she came to the city, and I was in the city, and she was told that uh, James is in the city. So she came looking for me, and when I saw her, I died. <sighs> I could, not, I could not stand seeing this lady that I've been waiting to see and to tell this great story. I, I'd not uh, uh, talk. And uh, normally we express by, when we face something like this, we say the whole stomach was full of water. 
She spoke. Okay, we went outside. I told her I received your letter. I will respond to you in due time. So we parted. I wrote her a letter, diplomatic, evangelistic, <laughs> not touching these things. And I told her, if you want to talk to me, please come to, uh, to, to the college. And she came to college. But when she came to college, she came to ask me about how does one know that he is called of God? Oh, my Lord. I said, okay, I keep these things down. Okay, this is what it is, maiden servant. So I began to tell her about that, and she succeeded, and she came to the college again. But before she came to college, I told the Lord, this is not going to be good. She is here. I'm here. I am not free here. So it was like, I must go and speak to her. I went home. I told my mother, uh, April now. My mother, I want to go and speak to a woman that I'm intending to marry. So give me a ticket. I want, I want some five shillings. I want to go there. My mother told me, shh, what are you saying? I want to go and speak to a girl. No, 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 no. My father and your father and myself have already began to look for a young lady around here. A lady that we think she is good, she will take care of you and take care of us also. Oh my Lord, I looked at my mother and I said, sorry, I must do this. I mean, I, I must have a woman that I like. I mean, it's not everybody. And you remember what my grandmother was saying, don't marry from these people. <laughs> don't marry from these people. Don't marry from this tribe. So your grandmother was ammunition for you then he to was, fight back uh, with your mother. Yes, she was very, very, very um, tough. Okay. In fact, she called my son. I belong to her. Mm -hmm. And now you can begin to see how things are going. So uh, I told my mother, please let me go. And my mother gave me the five shillings. I went and... I did not want to go in the morning. I went in the evening. Because when you go in the evening, symbolically, it means you will not return to your home during that time because mm. you have not spoken the information or the news that you are bringing. So I went at that time. I began in the morning, but uh, I arrived at, at that time. I passed at different places. I asked, have you seen so-and-so? I was told, yes. Have you seen? Oh, we were with her yesterday. We prayed together. Oh, okay, thank you. Just to know that she is there. So I went, and I found uh, a mother and, uh, and uh, Rhoda, and uh, we ate and we did everything. So it was a time for us to remain together. Mm -hmm. But the mother said, let's go and sleep. So I, I said, Lord, do something. Do another miracle here, because we are now asked to go and sleep. So what happened was uh, we remained, and I asked Rhoda, please, you have been my sister in Christ. But I have seen you beyond being my sister. I'm looking for a wife. Would you be my wife? And my Rhoda looked at me, and she was a little bit hesitant. And I told her, you can have three months to tell me. Please, don't tell me now. She said, no. You even have delayed on the way. I've been waiting for this. I had to stretch my hand and greet her and say, let us pray. We pray. After that, she asked me, when are we married? I said, no, I was not ready for this. So she was going to college. I told her, uh, we are, you are going to college. I am going to college. Um, after I leave the college, I have two years to go and build a house for us because I have to prove to the parents that really I can provide. And I'm not marrying their daughter in a little igloo somewhere. So I went and built a house. And so after that. Uh, uh, did Mbuva improve this? Um, 82, you built a house, right? Yes, the house was built 1982. Okay. Uh, you said... Did Mbuva approve of this? Uh, when did you get his permission? Okay, of the marriage? Yes. Oh, my. It took a long time because I first came and told my mother, and my mother uh, uh, said yes. And Rhoda went and told our mother, mm -hmm. and mother said yes. So when everything was ready, I went and told Mbuva when there was no failure because... That's like the final mm -hmm. authority yeah. here. So Buva said, I need to see the lady. So I went to the parents of Rhoda and said, my father wants to see the lady. So the mother allowed. The father allowed. So they came. My, mother, my father asked her, what do I question? Who is your father? My father is Mbuvi. 
Oh, I know him. He used to do this and that. And that was it. That was it. When I went to, uh, to tell her father, her father said, I would like to see your parents. So I took my parents there. And when they went, they greeted one another and they said, okay, you know what we do. And that was it. Yes, thank you. So what happened here, I came and built this house. My father told me I will not help you building this house. It is upon you, man, to build a house. And I said, yes, daddy. So I came and told them, involved them. And when our parents were together, when we were together, we began to work the marriage together. So within a period of four years, uh, we planned all the engagement parties, all the necessary uh, bridal parties, everything we did within those four years. And uh, we finished everything until the time of 1993 when we had to go and marry. And, uh, uh, it was a big wedding. We had a lot of people come to our wedding. We were married by one of our professors in college, uh, Titus Kevunsi, and there he is, and there is where we are. Many people came, and during that time, my father and the people and the churches came together to bless us. They gave us gifts, chairs, goats, sheep, cows, bulls, everything, because we had nothing. In fact, that night, where, uh, no, that day when we came to the, uh, to the wedding, I didn't know I did not buy a bed. Hmm. So a certain brother, <laughs> things are difficult, a certain brother went and bought a bed, a complete bed, and placed it there. So when we came, we, we found a bed. So everything was highly corporate. And everybody did something. So we went home, we found chairs. When they, when they gave, they transported them to, uh, to our home and we found them there. And the goats uh, uh, were given to us there and everything What was kind of bride wealth did you actually have? Did you have to give Rhoda's family a certain amount of goods? Wah, wah, wah. Yes, a lot of it. I had to uh, accumulate 22 goats. We had given 22 goats and three cows and three bulls. And in fact, one bull down here was killed that night so that we may eat and marry so that the parents of the daughter may release the daughter without knowing anything, without anything. This is intended. This is symbolic. Because if you don't give people food, I mean, what kind of person are you? Feed them. It is symbolically showing you can do a good job. And we, uh, I also gave... Kenya shillings, 3,000 Kenya shillings. Uh, my father told me, give me something that I may give them. Mm -hmm. So I gave him 3,000 and he gave. So he was really the negotiator. Mm -hmm. I was following what he was asking me to do. Okay. And that was the sweet part of it. Now, um, so all of these people were in the wedding. This is my wife's uh, father. The mother can, uh, I think, uh, she will appear in another uh, uh, scene. I can go back if you want. Yeah. Um, this is the, um, the father. My father is there, very tall man. And myself there, my wife, Rhoda, uh, my wife's mother, um, Lydia, and my mother here, Cavele, they are there. The first wife of my father is not here. So this was a special occasion that we needed only the father and the mother. So... This is uh, Rhoda and James, very happy. This woman is good. So she, we occupied the house together, and it was good. This was the best thing to happen in my life, to get a woman that loves me. This is our firstborn, John. That's our firstborn. And immediately, we didn't know planning or something. Immediately, we, immediately a daughter came, and we said, welcome. So. That's uh, Rachel, and this is the family as a whole. My mother, um, uh, my mother, and uh, the third born, and the, uh, uh, the, sorry, this is the third born, who, who is being born here. And my mother, my mother here, and uh, my wife's mother, they are there. 
The reason why they are there is to confirm that we really are in a good marriage covenant and they agree that we are doing the good thing. This is the, uh, uh, the last bond because our daughter was asking us all the time, where are women in our, in our house? Because she only saw brothers but no daughters. And so she was saying, where are women? So when this one was born, she said, hallelujah. She wanted to hold her all the time. And this is the, presently the uh, Molly's future generation. And that's John, the firstborn, the secondborn girl, the thirdborn boy, and the lastborn daughter, who is uh, a very dear daughter to us. So that's briefly what it is. And bride wealth, bride wealth means a lot because it cements the, the relationship. It is not a payment of any kind. It is a cementing of uh, a relationship, uh, basically not a contract. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to break now, and then after the break, we'll give the class a chance to ask you some questions, uh, and we'll debrief a little bit of the story that you've told us. So thank, thank you. you very much, James. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, welcome to the second hour. Uh, we're going to begin this hour with uh, a debriefing of the case study that James gave us in the last hour. Uh, then we'll go on to Lecture 10, looking at the issue of control, the basis of social structure. I'd like for you, first of all, <clears throat> to ask some questions out of the last hour when we kind of gave an overview of the things that we would look for in marriage. At this point, you're the anthropologist. You're doing the analysis of this case. So who has the first question? Okay. Julie? James, when uh, <clears throat> you paid the bride price, did you pay it all at once or over time? How was that organized? Uh, the 22 goats and uh, the three bulls <coughs> and, of course, the, uh, the cows um, were paid just for that time. It was like uh, I had given five goats. That were the goats that were to say we were really ready to, to bring some bright wealth to the family. But then this was a, a big chunk so that... Uh, we may prove, my family may prove that really they are capable of uh, having the daughter married in their home. Uh, but that was the beginning because immediately after we married, uh, Rhoda's father came and told me, I have a daughter that uh, was going uh, to high school and I do not have uh, enough tuition. So would you take over, my son-in-law? So basically what happened, I became a son in my wife's family. And uh, if there are any problems, I am going to be called in to give advice and also to contribute. I was also able to help in other areas in the, uh, when their son was in difficulties. Even recently, they had some, some hospital debt with uh, hospitalization that they went through. They wrote, the father wrote a letter and said, our son-in-law, we are in this difficulty. So, do something this time. I was here, I'm a student, I looked at my wife and said, my father-in-law has cried to me and we must do something. People, you must be eating beans, reduce meat, all of this, so that I may meet that obligation. And I did. So okay. in a sense, are you still paying or would you consider your bride price already paid? Not really, it is not finished until the last hour. In fact... What do you mean by the last hour? The last hour means <laughs> the last hour to stop doing it. And that will not be stopped until we all go. Because even the, um, when I was a young boy, I took some, uh, a cow to my grandmother's home. My father told me the family asks for a cow, so take it. Because he is the one that is supposed to take it, but he said, take it there. You know, my grandmother, who was very old. So you never finish bride wealth. You will still be good to that family because they have given you a good thing. A daughter is precious. It's not something to play about. Okay. James. Okay, I was wondering what, why Mbuva's first wife was not present. Is it normal that she w would not be present, or should she have been present at the wedding? 
if if she would have been here in the um, in the in the picture, she was in the wedding, and she participated in other areas. When my wife, when my father was called to come in times of gifts, because they gave gifts, she came with her father. My father first, she came second, and my mother came third. But in this case, it was the parents of the bride and the bridegroom, and uh, the camera had uh, the cameraman had to uh, to ask that preference to, to be uh, seen there. If she would have come, it would have been, she would have been a, a black goat or something, uh, somebody missing. What do you mean by black goat? <clears throat> One that, uh, she has no match. Uh, uh, it is not her blood son that is married. So in that sense, she would be really limping in that case. Was she involved in the, uh, <clears throat> the discussion of the arrangement of the marriage at all? Definitely. Okay. Uh, she was involved. Well, my father, when he was asked to go <clears throat> and see the parents, my father summoned his two wives and uh, he, he asked them uh, to prepare uh, speeches and he tested them. He is a kind of man that is so bright. He tested to see what they would say. So he said, Ngi. Uh, uh, say something, and uh, he says, "I will say this and that." My mother, my, my mother said, "I will only smile, because if you are receiving something, you don't say much. Okay. If you say much, people may may begin to see some loopholes." Okay. So. Other questions, uh, David. Yeah, there are two questions. Uh, first one is who pays the wedding, and the second one is uh, is there any particular rules after you get married that you should have a children and maybe the other one is uh, you should have a boys rather than girls yes um, <clears throat> the uh, the uh, the man's or rather the uh, bridegroom's parents are responsible for the wedding and if they are not strong financially, they say to their son, you've got to show us that really you are ready for this. For example, my father told me, you know, I don't work. I'm just a, a herdsman. I keep cattle. But one thing I promise I will do for you, my son. I will give you a cow, a great cow, and I will give you 10 acres of land as gift uh, in your wedding day. I will do that. But how to bring the uh, parents of my wife and the relatives and the church where she went, she was raised, it's upon you. Is it right, man? He said, I, I said, yes. And they told me, I don't fail, don't fail me. So we did this, both of us. But he said I should be responsible in everything here. So we did together. And he did not want to involve um, other people um, particularly in, uh, in, the, in the financial obligations to plan and do things. But in the, in the, in the bride wealth, independent upon his brothers, uh, uh, my uncles and uh, other relatives, they, they pulled together and brought this. And when we visited my wife's home, when we had parties there, the family, the relatives, the community, was involved in contributing. Some people contributed uh, flour, wheat flour, others, many things. So in that way, we did that. But the family of uh, the man that is married is responsible for the wedding to feed people, transportation, and everything. The second question, David? Yeah, the second question. Is there any particular rule that after you get married, you should have children? Uh, definitely. If you don't have children, uh, then something is wrong. And probably you married in the wrong family. Um, and that's why the parents would turn on you and say, you know, your choice is not good. So if we did the choice, we would have got into the family that uh, we know are fatal uh, families. But now, see what has come. So the expectation is, uh, of raising a family is, is very highly expected. Uh, I am the firstborn of my uh, mother and also Mbuva, as far as uh, sons are concerned, and they expected my wife to produce. They expected us to produce. 
and graciously we did. Other questions? Yeah, sorry. If you don't have children, what, what do you, uh, you do? You divorce your wife? Uh, if I were not a believer, I would marry another one. Presumably, if I am not the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. But I, I, uh, I am a born again, and I, uh, I did not think there is going to be a problem. And again, we don't go to the hospital for them to, uh, to have some experimentations to see that. We don't do that. You, uh, this is faith, real faith. You believe the woman is fertile, you believe the man is fertile, and you go into the covenant. Okay, okay someone else? Would your father expect you to marry another woman if you didn't have children? Yeah, and the society, yes. Society. Mm -hmm. okay. You have a younger brother. If he wanted to get married first, would that have been allowed? No. Your father has no authority to change that. He would, uh, no, he would not, uh, my brother would not have been allowed to marry first. No, he cannot. Okay. But does your father have, let's say, the say in, in changing that? Is that a cultural mandate, or is that up to your, your family and your father? It's cultural mandate, because uh, just as uh, in, in, in Leah's case, when we were reading this, I was saying this is very true. Uh, even if you loved a second-born girl, you wait for somebody else to marry the first one, and then you go and groom the, the second-born girl. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's the same. You, uh, if you are fast, you must come first. First of all, you would be uh, told you have no experience. <clears throat> what shall you give this daughter? And the society and the obligations, you, you want to carry them. They are very heavy, it's heavy yoke. Okay. So time, age, and ability to produce and really take care of the, uh, someone's daughter, that is highly considered as um, time to, to get married. Okay, other question? Marcy? How, how old were you when you got married and do you have to be a certain age in your culture to get married? 31 years, 31 uh, was the age. We were considered, I, we felt we were a little bit late and uh, we really wanted to, to, to hurry up uh, because... Hurry up, it took you four years to get through that <laughs> process. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. No. I noticed that. It, it was 1979 to 1983. That's a long time. Yes, that's a long time. But when, when really we, we got married, we wanted to go and do our business and uh, not look behind. It, uh, she, my wife is always uh, behind me with five years. Uh, so I was that one. She was 20-something. Um, that one minus five, 26. And uh, for her, that is really a very big age. I mean, she was highly aged. A, a woman could be married from, uh, from, uh, from 18 on, you know, but not below that. Some cases, if she is married, be, uh, uh, below that she has to go and uh, uh, remain under the uh, parental care for her to be, to be raised up to that uh, situation. But us, we were really people, as I would say in, in my culture, we had horns. We knew how to do things. So when we went, we, uh, we asked if the Lord may give us children at once. And it happened, and uh, one thing we wanted, we wanted to grow with our children. I, I hate just being an old man with gray hair and little boys jumping here. I mean, that's no good. And, uh, but we were not late, but we were at a very mature time of marital status. Good. Uh, Faith, did you have a question? Well, I was wondering, um, when you wanted to get married, um, you asked your mom first, rather than your dad, yes. for permission. Is that usually the customary way? Uh, basically, <clears throat> father is the, is, the, is the top. It's like the uh, president of uh, Biola University. Uh, you don't go there before speaking with people at the lower cases or, or levels. So mother is always very sympathetic. Mothers are very sympathetic. They are very understanding. 
if something fails, my mother would understand, my father won't. You know, because if I bring something to him and I'm a man, when I begin to br bring things that are failing, when the real thing is coming, this man is going to dump me down. I mean, he's going to say this man is a failure. So th we fear failure so much. And uh, uh, the mother would encourage. So I, uh, I went and told her. And when I brought, uh, when I saw Rhoda, graciously, she gave me a photo. And I came and showed my mother. And she looked and said, oh, she's a good girl. But will she disappoint you? That was the first question. Will she disappoint you? I said, my mother, I can't know that. I, uh, my spirit is restful because of knowing her. So uh, we believe. But when I, uh, I had uh, knowledge of who Rhoda was, I mean, uh, I was restful. There was no doubt. But I wanted to follow that because I was going the contrary of the culture. Because my mother told me my father and I mm -hmm. had seen a woman, a girl. And in fact, in the village, I knew her. But I am not interested. First of all, she's not as highly educated. Secondly, maybe she's not very beautiful. You know, some few things there. You know, a young man needs to have something of his choice. So uh, I was contrary, but I wanted to cooperate to them to the last digit because if it overturns, then I suffer. Um, so my 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 mother was with me, but she did not tell my father because if my father knows that. I have some special arrangements with my mother. My mother will be in a hot soup. And so, I mean, it's very delicate, governmental kind of authority. So when I knew that everything was working well, I went to my father and said, I have a girl. Okay. Good. Any, someone else? James? Just, is that the normal process that you would approach your father, or would the parents arrange someone and then approach you afterwards? Um, I would have sent my uncle, but my father and I are very close, so I wanted to tell him, and he is like waiting at that point, waiting to hear from me. So when I tell him, it's better, because then he knows that I, I, I confide in him. So when I told him that, he said, yes, you have told me, but let me see the girl, something I have never seen in my life. And I went and uh, uh, began for Rhoda to come. And when she came, he did not ask many things. He just was want, uh, he wanted to look at behavioral attitudes. That's what I gathered later. He wanted to look the way she speaks, the way she looks. Does she look into the eye or she looks down? If you look into the eye, you are not the kind. You must look down. No, you don't look into the eye. America is different. Mm -hmm. If you don't look into the eye, you are a liar, mm -hmm. you know, something. Mm -hmm. But here you look down, that is respect. So my father was satisfied with the question, whose daughter are you? Mm -hmm. And then she said, Bovi. And then my father said, I know the man. And that was it. It's interesting. I noticed as I was looking at the pictures, you probably missed it, that in the pictures in the wedding, Rhoda was always looking down. Uh, and uh, it was her showing of respect in that situation as to how she should look uh, in this public setting. So any other questions? We have time for one more. OK? Just Jane? going back to um, in one of the readings, we talked about um, social implication of age <coughs> within marriage. Um, was you, you mentioned that both of you were on the older side. Was there any social implication for your parents that you were married so late? Or, if, or were you considered married late? Yeah, my, my, my parents, if I, if I passed this time, my parents would be very concerned because they want the children, they want the heir into the family. The children are not mine alone. They belong, in fact, my children call my father their father. I, I don't have the title of father. My father is their father. My mother is their mother. That's how they undress. We are other species, oh no, no, other people um, they call us daddy, they call us, uh, they call my wife uh, mama or something, but father, now my father, hmm. my two, my mother. So here, when the children come, they don't belong to us only. In fact, they fight to stay with them. <coughs> and we tell them, we've got to stay with our children. And then they watch, if we don't take care of them, they will come and take them. Hmm. Yes. Okay. 
<laughs> okay, Inter excellent. Let me ask you this now. If you were to summarize, uh, what are some of the key m meanings that you've picked up in this discussion from James' story uh, in, and the, the key issues of social relationships or social structure that you've pulled out of this? How, how would you just summary, summarize now what you've learned in this process? Just straight off the top of your head. It's not necessarily a highly structured environment in terms of marriage ceremony, although they have a lot of the structures. Okay. It's not a, um, the parents don't seem to be actively seeking out for on his behalf, like some cultures do. Okay. So it's not a, you, you, the, the arrangement was not one that they aggressively did. They let James take a large role in that. Okay, good. What else? Offspring is one of the primary reasons for getting married. Okay, having children is a major reason for getting married, and it's a very important concern of the parents. Good, what else? Bride wealth provides a means of cementing uh, the relationships between the two families. It also gives the uh, wife's family a means to uh, create exchange with the, with the new husband. Mm. Okay. Okay, good. Good. Excellent. What else? Anything about roles? Okay, David? Who is giving the uh, last decision or, uh, you know, for the marriage? Okay. The parents or him? Okay, well, when you, as you listen to his data, what would you conclude if you're the, you're the anthropologist? <laughs> uh, the last one is the parents. Okay, okay. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. You have the very important role of the father in this uh, indicated in the story. Anything else that you observed? Conclusions you would draw as you look at it. Another question let me ask you, how would you say, what have you seen here that would be distinctive from some of the things that you would expect in marriage and it's an interesting contrast for you? I guess the, maybe the strictness of the order, the first child has to marry first. Okay. Whereas um, maybe America it's a little bit more flexible, it doesn't okay. have to be the first child. Okay, good, good. That's excellent observation. Uh, his situation is very much like the story we read in the Old Testament to start with. Very strict birth order, but there's much more flexible in America. Other contrast. The timing of just for him to go back home after he, he talked to Rhoda about getting, let's get married, then he spent the next four years of preparation for getting married. Mm -hmm. Usually in America, you, you if you say you're going to get married, I think the rule of thumb is no longer six months, but no longer than 12. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, that was an interesting thing that struck me as well, because once my wife and I had made the decision, we informed our parents it was eight months, you know, almost exactly until the day we got married. Whereas uh, four years, I thought, James, what took you so long? You know? uh, number one, uh, Rhoda was preparing to go to college. And uh, I had gone to college and I, was, I had seen that it is tough, it is not easy. And I did not want her, in fact it was my choice, mm -hmm. I did not want her to, to, to have this big burden of being hmm, burden, a lord of being a wife and we would have children. Because mm -hmm. obviously we were, we, in my culture you don't marry and stay like five years without mm -hmm. children, you've got to have children. Mm -hmm. And uh, or else you begin to see your mother and the mother of your wife come and say, what's wrong with you guys? Mm. Um, so uh, I knew she was going and this was basically our arrangement. I, I told her, I think it is good for you to go through four years mm -hmm. and uh, I will need the last two years because I was in college too mm -hmm. and I had done two years. And when she was coming to begin her first year, uh, I was going to be in the third year, so I needed these two years to go and prepare a house. Okay. And particularly to, to, to convince and, uh, and really to prove that uh, I mean what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And I was a pastor, and pastors are not highly recognized. They are considered poor. Mm -hmm. Everything, 
is very poor. So in this case, I wanted to, to set something that is a model. You know, that this is God. This, this is God's thing. So it has to be done in order. So I felt that was a very nice uh, uh, time. And I gave Rhoda time to, uh, to really go through college. Mm -hmm. And we agreed after college, it will not go beyond three months before we are married. So she graduated mm -hmm. in March. And immediately, uh, August of 1983, we married. Isn't it good we asked that question? Mm -hmm. uh, you see, we, we were looking at this and wondering why, but not really understanding. Now we have a very interesting decision that they made together. Mm -hmm. And it really was part of his concern for Rhoda and their concern for education, which was really a change agenda. It's not a mm -hmm. traditional one at all. So your parents would have been happy if you'd married uh, very soon and had children very soon. Yes, but they would also ask me, why are you going to keep this daughter? Mm -hmm. So they are still looking to see uh, how wise the house and, yeah. this man is. Yes, how wise this man is. And, 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 and again, according to the, to the Bible, it says a, a foolish man is a reproach to, to the father, something. They want to have a child that will think and evaluate things. And uh, they were going, and I was the firstborn. Uh, and uh, I was in every corner to be tested mm -hmm. anyway. So I walked my path carefully. <laughs> Good, so great, excellent. Thank you so much, Jane. <laughs> it's really wonderful. Let's give him a hand. Yeah. <laughs> Tremendous help. I really appreciate you doing this. You know, I have to confess to you that the reason that I'm videotaping this uh, course this semester is because James is here. She's finishing his doctoral dissertation. He's going to leave, and I won't have him around. And uh, how many years ago was it when we first did this, James? About five? Yeah, this was 1993. Um, 93 is um, okay. every, every 10 years. He was in this class as a student, and I... Uh, just got the bright idea when I was lecturing on marriage. Said James, why don't you come up here and tell us about how you got married? And that's the first time I heard this story, and it was spellbinding, and it, it has been for all of us tonight again. So thank you very much, James, for your participation with us. As we look at control and think about control, we've seen a lot of issues of control in this marriage case study. We've looked at uh, who has the final decision making, what kind of things that you have to do if you're going to show yourself responsible. If he didn't build that house, uh, his father would have questioned his wisdom and his responsibility. Uh, there were decisions about um, finishing education and appropriate resources and, and how you're going to go about that. Who's going to provide the bride wealth? How that bride wealth will be exchanged? Uh, James's father saying, I expect you to get that bull over there to your relatives, uh, to your wife's relatives. In other words, his, his work and his father's work were together, and his father was really a key leader in this process. <clears throat> in reviewing what we've looked at, last week we talked about the idea of uh, social structure, family structure, and in your reading in Agents of Transformation, I used the concepts of grid and group. I'm not going to take time to discuss those tonight. If you didn't understand them in the reading, I'll be happy to answer questions for you in the break. But I'll just say briefly, the grid focuses on the authority structure, and group focuses on the commitment to belonging or not belonging. And in some societies, the authority structure is very strong. In others, it's very weak. In other societies, the group belonging is very important. In others, it's very weak. So if you put those together, you come up with the structuring of domestic groups. As we saw in our lecture uh, just a week ago, I'll summarize this, there's structural variation. We talked about bi-generational families, that's two generations, or multi-generational. And as James has told us his story, he built a house right in the middle of his parents' homes to establish a multi-generational household. We talked about positional authoritarian families. And we know clearly that James' family is a positional authoritarian family. It's one in which Mbuva is clearly in the top position, and he's the authority. And James is second. And it's very clear that he's second. His brother is lower in the hierarchy. And you have then these uh, structured arrangements within this that emphasize either the mother or the father and, and things of that nature. James's family is a multi-generational paternal family. It's focused on father-son relationship, whereas uh, other families that we've looked at in our lectures have, have been different types. We also talked about personal egalitarian families. And we had, again, the 
different types of those, very parallel to the bigenerational and multigenerational fraternal, sororal, and parental uh, in bigenerational families, and then the paternal, maternal, and grandparental in the multigenerational families. Now, this variation gives us then four major types of family that you can have in reference to authority structure. As we look at the issue of researching family then, we realize there are a lot of options out there. There are many different ways that family can be structured. And so oftentimes we make a mistake as Christians is thinking that God has anointed our way and that, that the way that we live family is really the biblical way of family. Well, actually, if you study the Bible carefully, you find that there's more than one family type in the Bible uh, and that there is the variation within those family types we really don't even notice because we don't look sharply enough and carefully enough. For example, we have described tonight the story of Jacob with Rachel and Leah. In actuality, the, the pattern for Jacob, Rachel, and Leah is really one that's personally egalitarian, not positional authoritarian. Uh, and if you go back and read the story carefully, you find there's a lot of negotiating going on between Jacob and Laban. Uh, and they manipulate each other. They deceive each other. James would never think of doing that with his father. You know, it would be utterly un, un, out of the question or with his father-in-law. You know, they're clearly in a very positional, authoritarian, structured relationship. And there would be absolutely no question when J James gets a letter from his father-in-law says, you need to help us with school tuition for my son. James helps with school tuition for his son. He doesn't bargain. He doesn't negotiate. He doesn't say, I'm sorry, I can't help you now. He does it. Whereas Jacob would say, well, I'm not so sure. You know, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> and uh, I think I'll leave. And Laban says, no, wait, no, I see God is blessing me because you're here. Let's talk about it. And so they sit down and talk about it. And Jacob says, well, I'll stay if you give me the, all the speckled animals in your flock. And Laban says, okay, that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. And so they bargain. James is not going to bargain. He's just not going to do that. He can't do that. He does what is expected. So you see, the positional authoritarian and the personally egalitarian are two distinctively different authority structures. And you need to understand that to understand the dynamics of family relationships and also to understand the interpersonal conflicts that develop, to understand the emotional ties that are between people, and also to understand how the Bible gives us the good news of the gospel that transforms family relationships. The kind of sins in these two different families are different. Okay? The sin of the father in Jacob's family uh, is different from the sin of the father in James's family. Okay? And the sin of the sons are different too. Because you see, it's okay for the son to bargain in Jacob's family. It's not okay for the son to bargain in James's family. And so if James starts bargaining with his father, he's being rebellious. He is really causing all kinds of trouble. He really couldn't do that. Uh, and but in Jacob's family, that's okay. Uh, and in fact, it was part of the structure. It was acceptable for him to do that. Now, it wasn't acceptable for him to cheat his brother out of his blessing. It was okay to cheat his brother out of his birthright because his brother had a choice, you see. It was clear, straightforward bargaining. I'll give you soup if you'll give me your birthright. And Esau says, oh, well, I'm starving to death, so I'll take the soup and you can have my birthright. What good is it to me anyway? That was okay. But when Jacob put skins on his arms and went in and took the blessing deceitfully from his father Isaac, that was not okay. Uh, now, James could not have bargained like that with his brother. Uh, his, the authority structure says you can't take your brother's birthright away in James's family. It's not acceptable. That's not the kind of thing that's appropriate in that culture. So as we look at these things, we're going to find that these authority structures result in people sinning in different ways. And we need to understand the patterns of sin that are in their cultures and how the culture actually defines sin. Uh, and then we need to be careful that we don't impose our understanding of what is sin for us in that context. Now, I'm talking here about socially defined sin. I'm not talking about morally defined sin. For example, uh, if the society says I'm allowed to argue with my father, then it's not a moral flaw to argue with my father. But if the society says, I clearly cannot argue with my father that this is offensive and really is challenging of his authority and I argue with him, then I have actually insulted my father and I have done something that is wrong. It's just unacceptable in that context. 
This is not social relativism, by the way. Uh, in both cases, the issue is what is a behavior which shows fails to honor your father. The command is to honor your father. Uh, so how do you honor your father in a given society? My father invited me to have dialogue with him. He invited me to even argue with him at times, but I knew what the boundaries were. And I knew when it would be rebellion and when it wouldn't be. Uh, whereas in James's situation, I don't think Mbulu invited you to argue with him much, did he? No chance. Okay, no chance, you see. And so if he did so, it would be rebellious and it would be... He would ask uh, for an opinion from him. Hmm. Okay. When he saw me grow up to that situation. But I would give my opinion, but then it is upon him to act upon what I said or not. Okay. Or he would tell me, now when we choose that, then we are going to suffer. So it's upon him. But I can't say, oh, no, 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 no. This is that, no. It's not. Okay. Okay, so you see that we're, we're working with these kinds of, <clears throat> of social situations. They have their own definitions. And as we try to think about this in terms of uh, understanding a biblical worldview, we have to really get at the heart of what the biblical message is and how it becomes a transforming power within any one of these social contexts. Now, in looking at research questions, one of the things that we, we try to do then is try to understand them better. We try to know how they're working and what's happening in their world. How do people organize themselves to ensure, number one, the reproduction of self? You say, well, why do we focus on that? Basically, uh, it's very important if society is going to, to live for people to have children. Uh, to not only have children, but to bring up those children as men and women of this culture in this society. Every society is concerned about that. And as James has told us his story, you remember that one of the things that is a very great concern is having children. And not only having children, having proper children. In other words, if he has bad children, then that's a shame to the whole family. Uh, that's a tragedy. And everybody then uh, looks around and says, oh, what a, what a terrible thing. And the, where, where do you pick this up in his story? When, when he brings home a girl, what are the first questions the parents are asking? Okay, they, they want to know, what about her? Is, is she, what did James say? How Rhoda looks? If she looks in the eyes, what's wrong? Okay, if she looks down, she's, she's showing proper respect. The respect issue right up front. You see, in that setting, looking in the eyes doesn't show respect. Looking down shows respect. So that's where he begins. In other words, he, he's watching her behavior, looking at her motions, looking at her attitude, and trying to see, is this woman going to be a woman that is respectful and will honor us in the society, or will she be disrespectful? So as you look at this, the reproduction of self is not just biological self. It's a social self. And that's such an important part of understanding the social setting. The other thing that, that people do is they organize to reproduce relationships. In other words, to ensure that relationships that are of value to them are continued and carried on into the next generation. As again, as we look at this particular story, you see that the ongoing tie between the families is reinforced by the economic exchanges. Uh, Rhoda's parents will not let James forget that Rhoda belongs to them uh, and that they have given her their most precious gift, their daughter, uh, and that for that, he should continue to be grateful to them and help them when they request for his help. And the relationships go on, and those relationships are ensured by this expectation. Sometimes people mistakenly think that <clears throat> bride wealth is buying a wife. Well, it could be in some cultures. It could be that, uh, that it's interpreted that way, but it's clearly not in this one. Uh, and usually if it's interpreted that way in a culture, the culture is sick, okay? The culture has gone through some kind of changes that has changed its values from something that was positive in relationship to the people to something that is sick. Uh, a guy at UCLA, uh, Robert Edgerton, has written a book called Sick Societies. This guy is not a Christian. He has no interest in, in the Christian faith. But he recognizes there are some societies that are sick, that they basically have gotten to the place where they're destructive to their people and they are destructive to the culture and ultimately produce uh, abnormal and detrimental social systems that destroy the very people who practice it. 
Uh, and he has illustrations of that. My particular perspective on this is that in some ways all cultures are sick. And if you've read my book, Agents of Transformation, you know in it that I've talked about the fact that God has given all men over to prisons of disobedience so that he might have mercy on them all. And my notion here is that in every society, the sin that we have in some ways infects the cultural system and leads to sick behavior. So I'm not saying you won't find sick behavior in families. I'm not saying you won't find it in, in communities. It's always there. If there's sin there, there is sick behavior. But it doesn't mean that the whole society is evil. It doesn't mean that the whole family system is sick. It means there may be some aspects of it that are sick, or some families who don't where sin has spread to the point where it really is a dysfunctional setting and a dysfunctional community. That's the point to add on what you have said on relationships. Even right now when I am geographically very far from my parents' in-law, um, my brother uh, visits them okay. and he carries some gifts to them. Okay. So he carries on the family obligation to the family of my wife. Okay. Mm -hmm. My mother, my father, are obliged to visit them at given times and speak to them and say okay. things are well. Okay. Now the interesting thing about that is that <clears throat> the rights of Rhoda's family are maintained even when James isn't there. In other words, this young man, James's younger brother, takes care of the rights of Rhoda's family and makes sure that that happens. Now that really is a healthy society. That's a society where the relationships are recognized. And what could be sick about that is if Rhoda's family abused it and misused it. Uh, and that could happen. Uh, there are some people who <clears throat> basically don't fulfill their obligations, who take advantage of other people. It happens in every culture. I was flying back from South Africa with a Nigerian. And he was a professor in a university in uh, Harare in Zimbabwe. And uh, we got to talking on the way home. And, and I said to him, you know, you're a very successful man. I said, how do you find going home to all the obligations of relatives? What kind of demands do they make upon you financially? And he said, well, he said, uh, my older brother uh, has been such a disappointment to my father and to us. Uh, he had every opportunity for education. My father gave him everything he needed for school. He wasted it. My father gave him money to marry several times and he never married. He had a child by one woman and a child by another woman illegitimately, and he said he's had all kinds of irresponsible children. He said, uh, one of the things that I have to recognize when I go home is I'm going to have to give gifts to my brother, and uh, my brother will misuse it, and he will abuse it, and it will be irresponsible. But he's still my brother, and I have to do it. And so I plan. I have money to give him. I have money to give my nephew. I have money to give to my niece. I have money to give to my sisters. He has these commitments. This man lives out those commitments in a way that is honoring to his father and actually honoring to his faith in Christ. Uh, he was a Christian uh, of the Roman Catholic faith, but he said, I'm, I'm a committed believer in Christ. And he said, uh, I know when I get home that I have these responsibilities, I will carry them out. His brother has completely failed to carry them out. He's lived in a way that's completely dishonoring to his family. And... Uh, he, he acknowledged, he said, I think my father spoiled my brother. He took away his incentive to succeed. Uh, and his psychological interpretation of this was that his father gave his older brother everything and the younger brother had to work. Uh, and uh, because his younger brother had to work, uh, he said, he gave me incentive. And so this man has a PhD. Uh, he speaks four languages, French, German, English, uh, and uh, and his Nigerian local language, I think it's, uh, I know what it is, uh, it's Igbo. And, uh, he, uh, and he probably speaks more. I, I mean, I was awed and impressed with him. He's a very, very intelligent man. But it, it was a wonderful conversation we had. But as we looked at it, it was interesting. He gave me this picture of the positive and the negative in his own family relationship, of those who did it well and those who did it poorly. Uh, that's why my father... <clears throat> He, he was the uh, success behind me, but in a very intelligent way. The first goat, is, he, he told me, are you ready for this? Show me the first goats. I bought the first goat. Okay, let us send them. And when we sent them, it was him sending. Mm 
Okay, okay, yeah. good. And then in the second one... He, he gave you your incentive, right? Yeah, yeah. and uh, in everything, even in the house, he told me I will not give you my penny. You've got to show that you, you are ready for this. And uh, in that way, he did not spoil me. He built me up. Okay. And uh, what this brother was saying is true. When you give so much, particularly to sons, you destroy them. Okay. Interesting. All right. What are domestic and larger social groups in any social setting? Uh, I just want to take a brief minute and talk about the fact that we have more than just the household. Mm. There are other kinds of family groups that we've looked at. Last week we talked about the clan, and we had uh, some basic information about clans. We also have what we call activity groups. Those are groups of people who come together for a short period of time to do something that's important. Mm. Uh, for example, a wedding. It's an important activity. And there may be people who gather around to help with a wedding uh, who may not necessarily be there the next time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it depends on the culture, it depends on the social situation. Every culture has to some extent some kind of temporary activity groups. Some cultures only have activity groups. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, those Dani Indians that I told you about in Brazil, they lived in a village, but every time they did something, the group was a little different. It was not a corporate group. It was an activity group, and whoever was interested came for the activity. If they weren't interested, they didn't do it. There are also associations of interest. People, for example, who belong to a church. Mm -hmm. uh, if you decide you want to go to a church, you, you're a Christian, you join that particular church, that's an association of interest. Now James told us last week that the churches in his particular area tended to be people from all of one clan. Mm -hmm. uh, but there also were a few other people who joined in and came to that church because they were interested in that place, didn't want to go to some other place. Mm -hmm. And so it's a combination of a clan and an interest group. Mm -hmm. And then there are what we call the long-term corporate groups. Those are the clans that James described that were part of his community where his household was located. The, it's corporate because they own land, they share common rights with each other, not necessarily that they own things together, mm -hmm. but they have a common commitment to help each other out. Yeah. There's a commitment to share labor. There's a commitment to help each other for gathering the bride wealth. How many people contributed from your family besides your, you and your father, Jane? Um, <clears throat> my uncles, all of my uncles contributed. My grandparents contributed. And the uh, community, even people that did not belong to our clan, uh, they contributed. Okay. So it was a community corpora uh, corporate uh, effort in, in this case. And what it is, uh, if I marry myself, I will be settled. If any other child will be married in that home, um, I back up, in that community, we will again be expected to do something okay. also to support. Because they all help, now you have to contribute yes. back. Yes. Okay. This is what we call balanced reciprocity, an exchange process in which there, there's this contribution, and it's corporate. This sharing is expected among people within the community to help each other out. Mm -hmm. Now, in looking at this, we can talk about what are the structures of authorization or allocation. Those two big words are not really that big at all. Authorization basically means the authority to get things done. Uh, who is authorized? to bring thing, people together, to make decisions. And Buva clearly was one who was authorized to mobilize all of this, and he is the one that James went to, and then James worked through Mbuva to launch the whole process. Yes. And it was Mbuva who told him, these are the things you have to do to start me, yes. then once you've started me, then I will take care of the rest. So the structure of authorization in that case was Mbuva, who is in authority to then mobilize the other relatives and the other clans people in that community to be involved. The structure of allocation is really the structure of expectation that is there for people to contribute uh, and to support the activities of the people in their clan and community. Allocation means to distribute, to contribute to the resources. And two kinds of allocation occurred here. One of them was the collection of all of this bride wealth uh, through Mbuva's leadership to the family. The other is the distribution of that same material when it went to Rhoda's family uh, and to her father and then out through that community there. Do you know what happened there, James? When uh, it was given? At, in Rhoda's section. Did you ever see that or hear about it? Or? Um, the, we knew they appreciated it. Okay. If they refused the first uh, five goals, we would have known that they are refusing us 
from marrying their daughter. Okay. But you don't know who got the goats and who ate them or where they went and over there? They, no, they went to Rhoda's uh, uh, family. Okay. Father and mother. Okay. And, and even we witnessed them produce. And we, okay. We later ate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Good. Good. So, so you saw the reproduction of those. Yes, goats, the yeah. reproduction. And when okay. we were drinking, I was saying, "Okay, I'm drinking this." <laughs> You know. Now, did Rhoda's father keep all of the other stuff that was given in the bride wealth, or did they he? They sold some, okay, because they had no, not enough land okay. to really keep everything oh. there. Okay. Did they, sh they distribute any to any of their relatives? I do not know. Okay. That is very secret. All right. Good. All right. Um, okay. I'm going back here. Okay. We, I want to just conclude with a brief comparison. Uh, of authority in domestic groups. And as we look at this <coughs> authority relationship, I want to begin by talking a little bit about New Testament Greek families. Uh, we don't really know much about the New Testament families, but if you take a look at the, in the scriptures, you don't have much description. You can get much more, by the way, in the, the uh, literature of the time. If you can read Greek, if you can't, you're in trouble. But Dr. Arnold in the New Testament department is good at that, so you can check with him and he can give you some references. But typically, the New, Greek, New Testament Greek families are positional families. Role and rule are very important in terms of their structure. And you can even find this in Greek today. Now, a key thing about this is that in that positional authoritarian, they're just like James's family in that marriages are arranged. But they're even more strictly arranged than James's family. The children usually don't have any say. And in fact, even in contemporary Greek societies, uh, the, the young couple might never even speak to one another until the actual time when they are married in the wedding ceremony. They may see each other across the village. They may know one another from a distance. But they would not be allowed to date, if you will, or to have any kind of contact. Marriages were not only arranged, but there was male domination in those arranged marriages, so that the structure was one in which the men were clearly in charge. There was a dowry required of the marriage, and the dowry regulations were rigid. Well, what the dowry means is that the girl's family has to give money to the husband's family for the marriage to occur. And this is a very strictly regulated thing, and oftentimes what the husband's family would require is they would require a certain amount of money for the girl to marry such a girl, such, such a, a man. In other words, it was a prestige thing for her to marry up. So in looking at this, the New Testament Greek family focused on arranged marriage, on male domination, on rigid rules. Very important to understand that, to understand Paul's writings in Ephesians. Okay? Now, if you go on and take a look at Jacob and, Jacob and Laban, the case study we started with, it's a personal relationship type family, not positional authoritarian. And there's personal choice in marriage. Esau chose who he wanted to marry. Jacob chose who he wanted to marry. High status of women. The women had much more say and much more uh, control in the family than you would have in a traditional Greek family. The woman's status would be low in a Greek family. The male status is high. Jacob, if you recall, uh, his wives gave him a pretty good time. Uh, difficult times sometimes. They, they would challenge him. They, uh, in fact, Rachel stole her father's idols and hid them, uh, and uh, her father didn't even find them. So these were, were women who had some say. The role status is variable. If you remember, we talked about Esau being in the fields, Jacob being in the kitchen. Uh, and so looking at these families, they're quite different from the Greek families. The Greeks were rigid. Jacob's is flexible and variable. Now, in thinking about these things, then, if you're looking at authority in marriage, you understand that we've got two different types of families. And I've said there are actually four types. We've only looked at two of them. If you read, then, what the scriptures talk about in the New Testament, you have to understand the New Testament message partly in its context. For example, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. To people whose marriages are arranged, there's no love basis for those marriages. There is no reason for a husband to love his wife at all, and no reason for a wife to respect her husband. Their parents foisted it on them. It was all a deal for the parents to get more prestige and honor, and we didn't have a choice. And so a man can say to a woman, well, I didn't want you in the first place. And a woman can say to him, well, I didn't like you either. And so their relationship is one of contest, one of, of destructive patterns of relationship between each other. When Paul says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, that brings about a significant transformation. 
We looked at Mbuva's household, extended family, senior male in authority, shared resources and labor. Last week we talked about the Daini household, negotiated daughter exchange. I mentioned that to you earlier. I forgot to talk about the negotiation. A man says, I've got a daughter and you've got one, I'll tell you what. Uh, we'll exchange our daughters for our older sons. I'll give you my daughter if you give me yours. Uh, negotiation to make sure that you've got a wife for your son. Flexible residence. They live with the parents for a while, then they move away. Instrumental sharing. Quite a contrast, actually, to what James prescribed from his particular family relationship. Now, as we look at biblical transformation, there are four things that I want to talk about in conclusion. The first is the key principle for being different in family in the scripture starts with God himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The parable of the prodigal son is about the loving father. Uh, the book of 1 John, John talks about the love that God had for us, the love of the Father uh, that is just so distinctive and so different. The key thing that God wants in our families is that we be like him, that there be fathers that truly love their children. And that can happen in any of these family structures. You see, it doesn't matter what the structure is like. The second one is loving the brother. Uh, we see this in Deuteronomy 6, 5, and 6. The first great commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is likened to it, love your neighbor or your brother as yourself. And loving your brother is a key component of family relationships. The third component is the loving husband. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's such a strategic thing. That's what Paul emphasized so powerfully in that text. And the last thing that I want to talk about is the respectful wife. The wife who honors the husband, helping to, him to be respected in the community. It's interesting. One of the things that a woman could do in Greek society is to destroy her husband's reputation. And she could do it by showing disrespect for him in public, by having an affair with another man, by letting her daughter run wild. Uh, all of those things destroyed a man's honor and reputation. And so a woman could easily undermine her husband in that context. The key thing that we want to see here is that if we want families that are like Christ, it's not positional authoritarian or personally egalitarian. What it really is is the loving father, the loving brother, the loving husband, and the respectful and loving wife. Those are the things that we can strive for no matter what family structure you have can bring about a transformed relationship in Christ. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.